Uh, let's begin. Now that the recording has started, we were at the beginning of Acts chapter 16. So let me quickly show us the picture of the second missionary journey, and then we can discuss. Here you have it. Uh, I hope it is clear enough. Uh, if you can follow along here, uh, we are starting off from Antioch. Remember, we have a new team now. We don't have Paul and Barnabas together, but we have uh, Paul and Silas, who are a team who begin their journey from here. Uh, of course, Barnabas took John Mark and went a different route. Uh, we don't know, you know exactly what uh, the regions that Barnabas touched were. So here are the ones that Paul went to. So from Antioch, uh, we know that uh, he ministered in the region of Sicilia. Remember, we read that Sicilia, Tarsus, Sicilia. And from there, he goes to... Uh, Derby and Lystra. This is where he uh, meets with Timothy and then he circumcises Timothy uh, and then he goes back to the older cities, Iconium. We are familiar with that place. We are also familiar with Antioch of Syria uh, where there was somewhat of a positive response. So there are churches here. So they go back to these cities and now Newer regions okay, uh, is what Paul has on his mind. So we will see him moving to newer regions. So he uh, w wanted to enter uh, Bithynia. Okay, Bithynia and uh, he, he wanted to enter Asia is, is what we uh, read. So that, that entire region, he wanted to do more ministry over there. But we'll see how the Holy Spirit will actually guide him not to minister here right now, but uh, through the region to travel, you know, into the Macedonian region. Okay, so that's what we are going to uh, see happen. Uh, so from Antioch of Syria via uh, Bithynia, uh, you know, Mysia, he goes to this place called Troas. And at Troas, uh, the team will be a four-member team. So Luke joins in. And when we uh, read about Troas, we'll see that the language in which Luke reports will uh, change. So he will write something like, we. So obviously, you know, Luke is also part of the team right now. So they have a doctor uh, you know, on the team, four of them, uh, Paul, Timothy, Jude, um, Silas and Luke. So from Troas, uh, he will move on to Macedonia. Macedonian region, we are going to read about all these places. Uh, there is Neapolis. Then we will uh, read about Philippi. And in Philippi, we will see that people of various sections of the society will be touched, the rich. OK, then there is this uh, a woman who is a dealer of uh, purple cloth. Okay, so she uh, accepts Christ. We have uh, people like a, a jailer and a slave girl. So you see, there are all strata of society, but they're all receiving um, the gospel of Jesus. So Philippi is a very important place. From there, Paul and team will travel to uh, Amphipolis, Apollonia. And then you know we will come to a place called uh, uh, Beria. Okay, Beria, uh, and then later on Thessalonica. Beria is uh, uh, known as a place where people used to search the scriptures. Okay, so Beria, then Thessalonica, uh, and then you know through the region of Achaia uh, and uh, you know uh, Athens, uh, another very very important crucial city. And you know that way he will move back, and then you know just 
sort of uh, touch places like Ephesus and all, uh, but then you know he will uh, go back. He'll go back to Caesarea and Jerusalem. So that's how uh, the next missionary journey will take place. So second missionary journey, uh, as far as the timelines that we are going to follow is concerned, we we take it as you know um, like a three to four year. Uh, period for the second missionary journey so from ad 49 to ad 52 uh, is is where you know paul uh, would have made his second missionary journey now as i told us you know if, if you look at timelines of different commentaries you will find different dates there so don't get worried or stressed about it we'll just uh, stick to uh, one way of uh, considering this now uh, also you know i had mentioned earlier that commentators say it was at least five years since um the first missionary journey and the the gap between the first and the second missionary journey but uh, as far as our timelines are concerned it's something like a three-year gap okay so uh, that's okay uh, don't don't uh, get too stressed about it so this is the picture of the second missionary journey and we can quickly look at you know how uh, this plays out so we were at the beginning of at 16, we saw that uh, Timothy has now joined the team. Let's read from Acts 16 and verse 6. Okay, uh, so here it says, Now when they had gone through uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them so you see how i showed you earlier the bithynia region the my the asia region uh so they paul wants to go there he wants to do the ministry but he's being forbidden by the holy spirit he's being restricted by the holy spirit and remember when we started the study of the book of acts we also said that uh though we uh, look at acts as the acts of the apostles uh, it is really the acts of the holy spirit you know, through uh, the apostles and the believers so uh, here we have the holy spirit directing the agenda directing the uh, path that the people of god needed to take so paul had uh, a particular place in mind you know, so he wanted to do ministry there but you see how Holy Spirit is giving him a different direction. Okay? So Paul is not able to go to Asia. He is not able to go to Bithynia. So what happens next? Verse 8. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. So he just comes to a place uh, called Troas. Now we may ask the question, how did Paul know that he was forbidden? You know, everything that we learned about in the prophetic ministry everything that we learned about uh, under the guidance of god you know the way the holy spirit speaks to us through an impression uh, through a quickened word um, through visions through pictures so in we don't know exactly how the holy spirit uh, confirmed that communication but paul knew that he should not go to asia or bithynia so here he is at troas just waiting you know, for the leading of the Holy Spirit. So how do we do ministry? We do ministry by the leading of the Holy Spirit, not just what we want to do, but where the Spirit leads us. So he's in Troas, waiting for God to speak. So verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. So God is speaking now through a vision this time around. What does he see in the vision? A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. It's almost like a direct invitation to Paul and team where you know he's being called to Macedonia. So Paul knew because of the vision, Paul knew that he needs to now take the ministry forward in the region of Macedonia. Okay, so we've seen that in the map. So he goes to Macedonia um, and verse 10. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go. Remember, I said in Troas, the language changes. We sought to go to Macedonia, 
concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So quite clear here that Luke has joined the team. So coming to the Macedonian region, so it's the region, and we've seen all these uh, you know, cities, Philippi, uh, we've seen like uh, um, Amphipolis, Apollonia, we've seen all those cities in the uh, Macedonian region. So you know, we'll talk about each of those cities. Now he's come to Philippi, what's happening in Philippi. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothras, and the next day came to Neapolis. Okay, so they come to Neapolis first. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we observe is all these uh, port cities you know, from where uh, the, ships, the ships would come there and the ships would go out of there. Those were all... Uh, very popular because a huge population of people was passing through those cities. So that's why even earlier when uh, Paul made the first missionary journey, he goes through Cyprus. So, you know, that seems to be the business route. That seems to be the, the easiest route uh, where, you know, you had a good connect through ship and then maybe uh, even roads. Okay, uh, connecting other regions. So similarly, this seems to be a popular route. So Philippi, uh, the, the verse here, verse 12 says, foremost city of that part of Macedonia. So among all the cities, Philippi is a popular city. It's a, um, you know, a famous city, a strong city. Uh, and the team stays there. What do they do there? You know, they have to find a way to do ministry, isn't it? Earlier, we saw that Paul and Barnabas went into synagogues. That was their best way of reaching people. How are they going to meet people here? So verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So what are they doing over here see strategy as per the city and town they have to pick a strategy they have to see where the people are and then you know go and speak about jesus so in philippi they come to the riverside so the riverside was a place where you know prayers uh, we we noticed from this verse that prayers were taking place there but also we know that the riverside was also a place of trade and uh, uh, you know business so that's where a lot of people would come and for some reason there were uh, wealthy women in this particular uh, city so women came there and uh, paul and team started ministering to the women at the riverside so what happens verse 14 now a certain woman named lydia heard us she was a seller of purple from the city of uh, tyatira who worshipped god the lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by paul so here is a god-fearing woman and not just that but she's a rich woman okay seller of purple it wasn't easy to be a seller of purple in those days. You know? uh, it was very expensive to get that purple dye. But you know, back in those times, uh, you know, we're talking about like AD uh, uh, 49, 50. Around that time, if there is a woman who is selling purple, she must have been extremely rich, a very rich woman. But look at this. She was a God-fearing woman, and as the message of Jesus was preached to her, her heart was softened to that message, and you know she uh, heard and took heed to the things which were being preached to her. Verse 15, and when she and her household were baptized, so what happened? Lydia is now a believer. So you see, city by city, you know, one person at a time, as some ministries say, you know, one person at a time, uh, people are being touched. So Lydia is now a believer, and not just her, we know that her family accepted Christ too, because we are told her household was baptized. And 
know a little bit more about Lydia, we are told. She begged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So you see how God makes a way. You know, where would they have stayed in uh, Philippi? Well, Lydia opened up her home. So uh, she became a believer. She was rich. She had the resources. You know, we see even in the Old Testament, we see uh, certain women blessing prophets, men of God, you know, Elijah, Elisha. Uh, and so God has a way uh, to open doors for his people when they are serving him. So we see that God uh, uh, provides a place for Paul and his team in Lydia's home. And she herself asks, she's hospitable. And she says, why don't you all come? Why don't you all stay with us? So in Philippi, they stay with Lydia. Who else do they minister to in the city of uh, uh, Philippi? Let's see. Verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the salvation, way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Verse 20. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe them. The multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So now Lydia is one person in Philippi. Who's the next person who um, uh, is ministered to? We see that there is a slave girl, okay, a slave girl who was bringing a good profit to her masters. She was functioning with the spirit of divination. Okay, what is the spirit of divination? See, basically, these are all demonic spirits who um, speak from their knowledge. So these spirits obviously knew that uh, Paul and his team are ministers of God. So, you know, they, they start to, uh, so the spirit of divination starts to uh, reveal their identity. Okay? And uh, uh, says these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, obviously, this kind of a promotion by a demon spirit uh, was not something that Paul was happy about. You know, if it was a positive thing, we wouldn't have seen him becoming so annoyed. You know, the verse there says, verse 18, he was annoyed. Paul was greatly annoyed. So uh, the demon spirit was... It wasn't the intention and it is never the intention of Satan to promote the work of God's kingdom, but to bring destruction. So though it sounds like you know, there was free advertisement for Paul's ministry, uh, we know that it was detrimental. So, you know, Paul picks it up in the spirit. He's annoyed with the demon spirit and he goes ahead and casts out that spirit uh, and it's a powerful deliverance because we are told that you know he ca he commanded the spirit in the name of Jesus to come out of her and it came out that very hour uh, now this is a matter of joy isn't it that uh, uh, a slave girl is set free from the um, uh, oppression of demonic spirits but people who uh, you know, kept her as a slave, her masters, they were unhappy because 
or they were making money out of her special abilities you know of of uh, um, saying all these words words of knowledge if you want to call them prophetic words whatever they were making money out of it and now that the spirit was out she would no longer you know, be able to uh, uh, say these so called prophetic words and that was not at all good for her masters they were at a loss so what did they do uh, they drag uh, you know the steam to the magistrates and they bring up a false charge against them they they uh, say something like uh, these men being jews exceeding the trouble our city okay, so how did they trouble the city they were doing good they in fact cast out a demon spirit from a girl but you see their uh, pride and their selfish agenda because they were not able to make money uh, out of their slave any more they make a statement such as you know trouble our city so we've seen earlier that paul was in these dire situations where uh, he was beaten remember lystra he was beaten so badly thrown out of the city the disciples gathered around him and then the next day you know he went to minister that's what we we read in acts 14 so something similar is beginning to transpire so uh, uh, he's accused and uh, uh, the magistrates you know listen to the words of these masters and what happens you know the um, verse 23 and when they had laid many stripes on them uh, they threw them into prison so they were beaten and they were jailed and a particular jailer is assigned and they uh, he's asked to keep them like safely like you know don't let them escape uh, and we are told that they are now in the inner prison and fasten their feet in the stocks so they are being treated as very dangerous criminals so in a prison is a place where you would keep you know people who are likely to escape um, uh, you would fasten the feet in stocks okay that was a way of imprisoning uh, uh, criminals such that they're not even able to move their feet are also stuck now they're chained their feet uh, are stuck so you know such harsh treatment uh, uh, for people who are preaching the truth and the love of jesus and it's uh, you know very sad to see so we saw that uh, the the philippian woman lydia and her family are saved um, the slave girl is set free but what is the final consequence you know paul is still in trouble his team is still in trouble okay and people are not able to open their hearts fully to the message of the lord jesus christ why you no know, it's like the story of uh, those people who told jesus to leave the city right uh, spirits were cast out of uh, a, a man and uh, those spirits asked to be sent into pigs and when the spirits went into the pigs they drowned and died so what did the people of that region do they said jesus our business our money is more important can you please leave this region you know we we don't care about your you know your your compassion and your deliverance and all of that so this is very similar a girl was delivered but people's hearts were so far away from god that you know they they did not receive the gospel and now we have beat a paul in the prison okay so what's going to happen in this inner prison when paul uh, you know has is is uh, uh, secured with the stocks okay verse 25 but at midnight paul and silas okay so uh, you know you might ask the question what happened to timothy what happened to luke we don't know we don't know where they are in the equation but somehow luke only mentions paul and silas so paul and silas would have been you know captured and taken to the prison so at midnight paul and silas were praying and singing hymns to god and the prisoners were listening to them you know, it's amazing when you read about uh, the apostles and ministers of god in the book of acts you know acts 12 uh, peter when he sees 
the angel guiding him, he thinks it is, uh, you know, a vision. How could Peter even sleep in the prison? You know, if one of us were in the prison, we'd be so anxious uh, that I don't know if we would be able to sleep. But you see Peter sleeping and uh, the angel guiding him out of the prison supernaturally because of the prayers of the uh, believers. And in this case, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Can you even imagine that picture? Your legs you know, are tied. Uh, your hands are chained. We, we've been beaten. Okay. Maybe you know, we can think of uh, just getting a quick rest or a nap or just getting a shut eye. But here are Paul and Silas at midnight. So it just shows us what kind of a lifestyle they had of pursuing after God, of worshipping God, that in the prison, in these circumstances, they are found praying, singing even, singing hymns to God. It's amazing. Okay, And how are they singing? Uh, not very quietly because that verse 25 says, and the prisoners were listening to them. So they're singing loudly to God. Maybe they knew the power of praise okay, very, uh, uh, very well. They knew that as they praised God, God would intervene on their behalf. So here they are in the inner prison, praying and singing to God in such a way that other prisoners could hear them. So whenever we worship God in this manner, what happens? Verse 26 starts very beautifully. You know, Luke puts it so beautifully. He says, suddenly. So God appoints suddenlies when we trust in him. Then we pursue him. So in a very difficult situation, as these two are worshipping the Lord, Paul and Silas, suddenly God does something. Okay, so something supernatural takes place. What, what is that? Suddenly, suddenly there was a great earthquake. You see how God works? Sometimes through an angel and, you know, sometimes through people. But now, even through a great earthquake. So that night, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. God is a God, you know, of, of uh, um, this world. He has created the world. He knows what he can do to set his people free. So this time around, it's an earthquake that shakes the foundations of the prison. And notice the words, suddenly, now immediately, immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. So you see the effect of the devotion of uh, Paul and Silas in the prison that God intervenes. Immediately, doors are opened, chains are loosed, not just theirs, but everyone's chains are loosed. So you see the power of, of devotion, of prayer and worship, that not only did it touch their lives, but the lives of the people around. Even their chains were loosed. It's amazing. So amazing. Just those two verses. In the midnight, but at midnight. You know, sometimes in our deepest, uh, most difficult challenges, the right thing to do is to worship God. And then we can experience the suddenly, because... God is almighty. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he knows what is best to get us out of that situation. And not only will we be, we be out of that situation, but you see how everyone's chains were loosed. So, you know, our worship can affect uh, others around us. Verse 27, at the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prison prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Okay, let me just uh, stop here. So what happened? The earthquake. Um, 
you know, lose the chains of everyone. We know earlier, you know, Herod, uh, when Peter escaped, right? He he killed the jailers who were in charge. So this is the the uh, you know procedure that they followed. That if prisoners escape, the jailers would need to die. So the jailer is petrified, and he thinks that it is best for him to kill himself. But you know, Paul assures him and he tells him, uh, "Do yourself no harm." For we are all here. So they were all still in the prison. What happens next from verse 29? Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Isn't that beautiful? You know, you don't see um, Paul preaching. At least in Acts 3, Peter preached, and then the people asked him the question. Now, what must we do? What what should we do? They were cut to the heart. But now, looking at the intervention of God uh, in Paul and Silas's situation, the jailer understood that these men are men of God. So look at his response. Okay, and not just that. Look at the uh, integrity of Paul and Silas and their compassion. They probably knew that if they ran away, the jailer would. Uh, be um you know uh, killed so they were there for the sake of the jailer and the jailer you know, touches his life and he asks them the question what must i do to be saved he would have probably heard the message you know of paul and silas earlier we don't know but this is his response and they minister to the jailer so three people right at least three people that luke mentions there must have been many more Lydia, slave girl, now the jailer. So verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same uh, hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in god with all his household wow what a what a uh, uh, you know positive ending to the story of paul and silas being imprisoned you see god is working in every situation even in the jail so now you have the jailer and his family believing jesus being baptized and also, you know, taking care of Paul and Silas. So that is how this this particular uh, incident ended in Philippi. So let's read on. Okay, what more uh, happens uh, after the jailer and his family are saved? Verse thirty-five. Uh, okay, let me just quickly ask all of you: Are you all doing okay? I'm just trying to go a little fast and cover the content but i hope it's not disorienting are you able to uh you know keep pace with me okay one person says yes how about the others yes pastor okay, okay. good 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 wonderful yes okay glad that uh, uh you are in step with me so let's go on so we're still talking about philippi uh, and let's see, you know, what takes place at verse 35. And when it was day, so uh, in the night, so many things happened. When it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let those men go. So obviously they have, uh, you know, learned about the earthquake and the jailers uh, situation and all of that. Uh, so in a hush hush way you know the the magistrates of philippi they were the ones you know, who beat up paul and silas and imprisoned them isn't it so they feel that you know they should not continue uh, overseeing this matter anymore so let's just close this case so quietly what they want to do is they say let those men go close this chapter verse 36 so the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, 
the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. Okay, so uh, that's that sounds good. That uh, finally, you know, Paul and Silas, uh, you know, in a in a sort of a legal way, because the magistrates have set them free, they can go their way and continue the work of their ministry. But how is Paul going to respond you know, to this decision of the magistrates? Verse 31. But Paul said to them, okay, Paul is not very happy about the way things are being done in Philippi. Firstly, without proper interrogation, without proper process, they were imprisoned and that too, the inner prison. And now, without a proper process, the magistrates are saying, yeah, yeah, you can go, no problem. Now, we know that Paul is a learned uh, individual uh, and he knows you know, about the Roman law much better than probably the magistrates. So he just looks at the shoddy way in which things are being done and he's quite upset. So he says, verse 37, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. So he's very upset. And also, you know, he declares uh, this information, which the magistrates probably did not know earlier. They knew that Paul was Jew. He was a Jew. But they didn't know that he was a Roman citizen. Now, in those days, being a Roman citizen was of great value. It was not easy to get the citizenship. And if you were, uh, if you had the citizenship, you know, then uh, you had great power. Okay, uh, And all declares this information and he says they have treated Roman citizens, uncondemned Romans, they imprisoned and now they are quietly putting us out. So this is not acceptable. Okay, He puts his foot down. So verse 38, obviously the magistrates would now be afraid because they figured out that Paul is indeed a Roman. Okay, That's scary. Okay, that they have treated a Roman poorly. So verse 38, and the officers told these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Verse 39, then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. Verse 40, so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and they depart. So anyhow, you know, uh, Paul uh, and Barnabas did leave the city. Uh, and one last thing they did before they left the city was to go to Lydia's house. So why did they go to Lydia's house? Uh, why do you think they went to Lydia's house before they left the city? Anyone? Any thoughts? Could it be to reassure, um, to strengthen her before they leave and encourage her? Sure. Yes. Yes. Daisha, to uh, strengthen and encourage. Um, that's correct. And we can also assume that by now there was a church meeting in Lydia's house. Okay. Uh, because some good ministry had taken place in Philippi. Now, uh, I'm sure. Uh, apart from just these three individuals, there could have been more people. Uh, so now you even have a jailer's household, right? So they all could have been meeting. So the church in Philippi could have been meeting in Lydia's house. That's why uh, Paul goes there, encourages the brethren and moves on from there. So uh, let's now go to Act 17 and see, uh, you know, what happens in the ministry of uh, the steam. Paul, Silas, uh, Luke, and Timothy. Verse 70. 
now when they uh, chapter 17 now when they had passed through amphipolis and apollonia they came to thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the jews then paul as his custom was so you see the normal way of ministering is to go to the synagogue so uh, verse 2 then paul as his custom was went into them and for three sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures okay so we understand that verse 3 explaining and demonstrating that the christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and say this jesus whom i preach to you is the christ verse 4 and some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout greeks and not a few of the leading women joined paul and silas so now in Thessalonica, they are spending time reasoning with the people. Your reasoning is also persuading from the scriptures. So preaching, yes, you know, you preach. Uh, uh, we've seen we've seen Luke use that term. You know, they preached earlier, but here he says reasoned with them so that just says that in an in a more earnest way in a more um uh sort of a continuous way uh paul put before you know the thessalonians all the reasons why jesus is christ and why they must believe so you see the different ways in which ministry is being done preach yes reasoning is also something that uh you know paul engaged in and uh, it's beautiful to see that there was a church that uh, arose in thessalonica so a great multitude of devout greeks okay, and there were also leading women so there must have been some rich women like lydia in thessalonica so there is a, a group of believers who uh, uh, who are now the church of thessalonica okay what happens next Verse 5, but the Jews who were not persuaded. So after all the reasoning, there are some Jews who are not convinced. What's happening? They are behaving like the Jews of, you know, we saw Sidia and Iconia. They rose up against, uh, um, you know, Paul and Thebe. So there is an opposition which happens even in Thessalonica. So these Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So Jason's home is where the church of Thessalonica met. But there is an uproar and uh, they attack this house and they you know, want to bring these uh, people out and you know maybe throw them out of the city so verse six but when they did not find them they dragged jason okay, so they couldn't find paul uh, and team so they dragged jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city crying out those who have turned the world upside down have come here to verse seven jason has harbored them and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of caesar saying there is another king jesus verse 8 and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things so when they had taken security from jason and the rest they let them go so very similar situation you know, like philippi what's happening just some false accusation uh you know, they also said that these people are troubling us. So here again, you know, another false accusation that they are preaching a new king called Jesus, who is above Caesar. And you know, in the accusation, there's actually a compliment to uh, uh, the believers. What is that? They say, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. So it's meant to be. A negative comment but notice how it's a compliment for the believers so what do we learn about the believers in the book of acts mm -hmm. their life made an impact on you know they using the word world but that simply 
goes to say that large regions, cities, towns, villages were being impacted by the preaching, by the uh, you know persuasion, the reasoning, the demonstration of the power of God. There's so many things that the believers were engaging in. So as Jesus gave us the great commission and said, go into all the world, and make disciples, we see the believers of the book of Acts and more so Paul and his team making an impact on cities. So today we saw in detail about Philippi, uh, but also Thessalonica. There was a church which was now established in Thessalonica. Okay. So uh, uh, legally, what do they do uh, in Thessalonica? They just say, okay, they said, you know, they beat him up. Uh, they take a security from him. Okay, they, uh, and you know, they let them go. So that is probably uh, what happened. And uh, you know, they want to ensure uh, that Paul no longer continues his ministry in Thessalonica. So uh, a lot of other interesting places coming up in the second missionary journey. Uh, we will study them later. There's going to be Beria, where we have people who are so uh, uh, you know uh, interested about the truth of God's word that they search the scriptures. And then uh, we will go to Athens. Okay, Athens, uh, a very intellectual, philosophical uh, city uh, in Greece. We'll see the approach that Paul and his ministry team have in these places. Okay, so uh, I know that you know I've gone a little faster than usual, uh, but if there are any comments, if there are any questions, we can take it up before we wrap up today's class. <laughs> Hello, Pastor. Yes. Uh, so I just want to uh, have the clarity of uh, preaching and reasoning. OK. Yes, Pastor. Okay. More clarity in here. OK. So uh, you see, preaching and reasoning, uh, I, you could look at uh, reasoning also as preaching. OK? So uh, just that we, when we talk about reasoning, reasoning is more with the intention of, uh, you know, gently persuading or convincing the people. So uh, the matters that that we may talk about uh, would would be uh, a little more in detail, a little more uh, step by step to help the people, you know, move their understanding from not knowing Christ to knowing Christ uh, and things like that. So uh, it's not very different, just that reasoning is a little more uh, detailed and uh, a little bit more of, uh, you know, uh, convincing sort of a, an approach. I don't know if you got what I'm saying, Pratik. Does it help? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. I can, I can understand, ma'am. Thank yeah. you. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so that's how it is. Okay, so reasoning is also preaching, but uh, a more convincing sort. All right, so uh, let's pray and wrap up today's class, and we shall come back um, to you know continue from Act Seventeen next week. So, can somebody please lead in prayer? Okay, Tasha, how about uh, you lead us? Sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the class today. We thank you, Lord, for the great work that occurred in Acts. And we thank you that your power still works today. And we pray, Lord, that we will be, you know, we will see the manifestation of your power in today's church as Paul, Silas, Lou, Lord John Mark Barnabas did back in the day and how they transformed lives of those who they encountered. And demonic spirits must know 
that you are the high God, the only one true and living God and the only high power and every other power must bow. Lord, help us, Lord, to connect on a deeper level with the Holy Spirit as we are your ecclesia. We are your church, Father, as we rise up and take authority in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Daisha. Thank you for that prayer. And thank you, everyone. So God bless you. Have a wonderful um, weekend. We shall meet next week. Bye for now. Okay. God bless you. Bye.